Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar brought to you by the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery and the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy. Tonight's topic is Return to Sports After ACL Reconstruction. I am Mark Swinkowski, Editor-in-Chief of JBJS and host for tonight's webinar. Through technology platforms such as this webinar, we are able to provide content that is important, timely, and available in an interactive format in the comfort of your office or home. During the next hour, we will be addressing a common question that doctors and physical therapists are asked by many athletic patients after an ACL reconstruction. When will I be able to play again? Current evidence suggests that approximately 50 to 60 percent of ACL reconstruction patients eventually return to sports at pre-injury levels, but the timing of that return creates a series of challenging clinical decision points. During this webinar, you will hear from JOSBT author Terry Chmielewski and JBJS author Dr. Freddie Fu. You will also hear from two expert commentators, Dr. Kevin Wilk and Dr. Kurt Spindler. Tonight's webinar is moderated by Dr. Robert Marks. All four experts on the panel will address questions from the audience to provide further insight into returning to sports after ACL surgery. I know that you will find the next hour stimulating and informative. Before we get started, I want to make sure you get the most out of this webinar. There are a few ways you can participate in tonight's event. You are welcome to ask one of our panelists a question by simply typing your question in the Ask a Question bar, which you will see below the slides. When you're done, simply press Submit. Feel free to submit a question anytime during the presentation. You can also read our spe speaker's biographies and the handout widget at the bottom of your screen, which contains PDFs of the two articles presented tonight. Additionally, the slides from tonight's webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow at noon. Now let me introduce our moderator, Dr. Robert Marks. Dr. Robert Marks is a professor of orthopedic surgery and public health at the Hospital for Special Surgery and Weill Cornell Medical College in New York City. He has published over 170 peer review articles and three books, including one on ACL injury prevention and a textbook on revision ACL reconstruction, and is also a, an associate editor for evidence-based orthopedics for JBJS. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for the privilege to moderate what I anticipate will be an exciting and informative event. Tonight we have four outstanding speakers who are experts on return to sports after ACL reconstruction. The first article to be presented was published in JOSBT and authored by Terry Chmielewski. Terry is an associate professor in the Department of Physical Therapy and an affiliate associate professor in the Department of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation at the University of Florida. She has written two monographs on rehabilitation of athletes with ACL injury co-authored 11 book chapters, and has 47 articles published in peer-reviewed journals. Our second author, Dr. Freddie Fu, is the David Silver Professor and Chairman of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He has been head team physician for University of Pittsburgh Athletic Department since 1986 and was instrumental in establishing the world-renowned UPMC Center for Sports Medicine. Dr. Fu's published over 500 peer-reviewed articles and presented over 1,000 invited lectures at meetings throughout the world. He has also been president of my two favorite sports medicine societies, AOSSM and ISACOS. Each author presentation will be followed by commentary by two return to sport experts, Dr. Kevin Wilk, Associate Clinical Director of Champion Sports Medicine and the Director of Rehabilitative Research at American Sports Medicine Institute. He will comment on the first paper, and Dr. Kurt Spindler, who has spent more than 22 years at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, where he was professor and vice chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Rehabilitation. He will comment on the second paper, and Kurt is currently at the Cleveland Clinic. We will save the last 15 minutes for questions from the audience. The questions can be sent in at any point during the presentation. Dr. Swiankowski will help me identify the most relevant questions, and I will direct them toward one or all of the speakers. Now let's begin with Terry. 
Thank you, Bob, and good evening, everyone. I'm honored to participate in the webinar this evening and present our article that was published in the Journal of Orthopedics and Sports Physical Therapy. I would like to acknowledge my co-authors on the study from the UF Health Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Institute and the University of Florida. It is well documented that ACL rupture is a common injury in sports. In the United States, ACL reconstruction is the treatment usually recommended for patients that want to return to sports participation. It is not surprising, then, that the majority of patients who receive ACL reconstruction expect to return to their pre-injury level of sports participation. However, the literature continues to show that not everyone returns to sports participation after ACL reconstruction. A recent systematic review and meta-analysis found that 81% of patients return to some form of per sports participation after ACL reconstruction, but only 65% return to their pre-injury level of sports participation, and fewer yet return to competitive sports. So what is keeping patients with ACL reconstruction from returning to their pre-injury level of sports participation? One reason could be that they aren't fully rehabilitated. Several articles have discussed the inconsistencies that exist in current return to sport decision making. Different measures or even different benchmarks for the same measure are used across clinics. For example, clinics may or may not use quadriceps strength testing in return to sport decision making. For those that do test quadriceps strength, different measures may be used or if they use the quadriceps index, the target could range from 80 to 90 percent. In addition, relevant measures may be absent from our return to sport guidelines. One measure could be the fear of re-injury because it is known to prevent a return to sport, but is not commonly assessed in return to sport guidelines. Therefore, the purpose of this study was to compare clinical variables between those who do or do not return to sport at one year after ACL reconstruction, identify clinical variables associated with re return to sport status in a multivariate model, and explore the discriminatory value of those clinical variables. This was a cross-sectional study involving patients with ACL reconstruction. All patients were seen for routine physician follow-up one year post-surgery at the UF Health Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Institute. The study had multiple inclusion and exclusion criteria. In short, the goal was to create a sample of patients with relatively acute, unilateral, and isolated ACL injury who had an ACL reconstruction. I've highlighted two important criteria. First, we included patients with a pre-injury pre Tegner activity score of at least five. The Tegner activity scale ranges from zero to 10, and five equates to per, at least um, participation in recreational sports prior to injury. Second, we excluded patients who did not return to sports at one year post-surgery because of social reasons. This means that all patients in the study had the opportunity to return to sports after surgery. Testing included a variety of clinical variables, which can be categorized as demographics, knee impairments, and self-report questionnaires. These are the demographic variables. Concomitant injuries included grade one ligament sprains, meniscal tears, and any chondral injuries not surgically treated. The knee impairments were a fusion measured with a sweep test, range of motion measured with a standard goniometer, side-to-side -side differences in anterior knee laxity measured with a KT-1000 and a manual maximum pull, and quadriceps strength measured with a Biodex isokinetic dynamometer and a test speed of 60 degrees per second. We analyzed two measures of quadriceps strength. First, the quadriceps index, which is a measure of symmetry between sides, and also the peak knee extensor torque normalized to body weight. Patients also completed several questionnaires, including a question about episodes of knee instability experienced after surgery, the Tegner activity rating, which I've already mentioned, the zero to 10 numeric pain rating scale, and for this we took the average of their least and worst pain levels over the past 24 hours, as well as their current pain level. The IKDC subjective knee evaluation form, which measures knee function, and the TAMPA scale for kinesiophobia, which measures fear of re-injury, or excuse me, fear of movement or re-injury. Subjects then answered whether they returned to sport and if it was at the same level of sports participation as prior to injury. If they answered yes to both questions, meaning that they had returned to their pre-injury level of sports participation, they were categorized as yes, return to sport. 
if they answered no to either of the questions, they were categorized as no return to sports and asked to select the reason for not returning to sports from a list that we provided. For the statistical analysis, we first compared clinical variables between groups using the appropriate test. Variables found to be different between groups were then used in a discriminant function analysis to identify clinical variables that predict return to sports status. Finally, cutoff values were created for the variables identified in this discriminant function analysis, and we then tested the diagnostic accuracy with likelihood ratios. And here are the results. There were 94 patients in the entire sample, and just over half had returned to their pre-injury level of sport. Males comprised about 60% of both the yes return to sport and no return to sport groups. In the no return to sport groups, fear of injury or lack of confidence or some type of knee symptoms such as pain, instability, or weakness were equally chosen as the primary reason for not returning to sport. For the group comparisons, I want to start with the comparison of changes in the Tegner activity score first because it supports our yes return to sport and no return to sport grouping. You can see that the mean Tegner activity score decreased almost two levels in the no return to sport group at one year post-surgery compared to a minimal change in the yes return to sport group. For those, the comparison of clinical variables between groups, I will only present those variables that were different between groups. The other clinical variables can be found in the paper. The table includes the values for the group, the p-value of the statistical test, and the effect size. The first two variables are knee effusion and knee extensor torque normalized to body weight, which came from knee impairment testing. The yes return to, group, yes return to sport group had relatively fewer subjects with knee effusion and a higher normalized knee extensor torque compared to the no return to sport group. The other variables were for, from the self-report questionnaires and included knee instability, the average pain rating on the numeric pain rating scale, the IKDC score for knee function, and the TSK11 score for fear of movement or re-injury. The yes return to sport group had relatively fewer people reporting knee instability, a lower average pain rating, higher knee function, and lower fear of movement or re-injury than the no return to sport group. The six variables found to be different between groups were then entered into a discriminant function analysis and a single function was identified. It included the presence of knee effusion, episodes of knee instability, and the IKDC score for knee function. The standard co standardized coefficients are given. The sign or direction of the coefficients was positive for knee effusion and knee instability and negative for IKDC knee function score meaning the presence of knee effusion and knee instability and a lower IKDC score discriminated groups. Based on this, the function identified the non-return to sport group. Cutoff values were then established for those three variables identified in the discriminant function analysis and were meant to identify patients who did return to sport. The criteria we set were no knee effusion, no knee instability, and an IKDC knee function score greater than 93. In the paper, the positive and negative likelihood ratios are given for meeting 0, 1, two or three of these criteria. I want to highlight from the paper that the positive likelihood ratio for meeting all three criteria was 14.54. This is quite high and is based on our sample. It is expected that the positive likelihood ratio would probably be lower if it were tested in another sample. And now I want to show you how the res results apply in the clinical situation using the example of meeting all three criteria compared to meeting only one of the criteria. I started with a return to sports rate of 60% at one year post-surgery. This value is between what was found in the meta-analysis and our study. This is our pretest probability. The pretest probability was converted to pretest odds and multiplied by the positive likelihood ratios. Again, the positive likelihood ratio is 14.54 for meeting all cri three criteria, and it is only 1.11 for meeting one criteria. Confer converting this to the post-test probability, you can see there's a 96% chance of returning to sport at one year post-surgery if all three criteria are met, or a 36% increase from the starting probability. And this compares to very little change in the probability if only one of these criteria are met. 
In conclusion, those who returned to sport at one year after ACL reconstruction had higher normalized quadricep strength and knee function, lower knee effusion, knee instability, knee pain, and fear of movement or re-injury. Of these, of these, the criteria for returning to sport were created for the IKDC knee function score, knee effusion, and knee instability. The results of this study can be used in future prospective studies focused on creating return to sport guidelines after ACL reconstruction. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. That was a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Kevin, what is your perspective on the information that Terry just presented? I think it's uh, very, very important information when we look at individuals that aren't able to return back to sports, uh, especially in their desired activity level as well. And what's interesting about Terry's results is how these symptoms or clinical findings uh, somewhat couple with each other, whether it be effusions or lower knee scores, instability, and quadricep weakness. So I think there's significant clinical relevance. It's a pleasure uh, to uh, comment on Dr. Shimoleski's paper. I think it's uh, a very, very important paper, and I want to congratulate the investigators on an excellent and important publication. This study attempts to unravel uh, the complex nature of why some individuals do well and other individuals cannot return back to pre-injury level. Many outcome studies focus on outcome data and measurements of specific time frames. And this particular study compares favorable to unfavorable results. And it, obviously, as clinicians, we've learned we can learn more from individuals that don't accomplish their goals than sometimes people that can. As Terry mentioned, uh, ACL injuries are very, very common. And sometimes, as the more recent studies have shown, the outcomes may not be as favorable as we once believed as far as scoring uh, knees after ACL surgery, but also radiographic changes from 7 to 12 years after surgery, and even a 10 times greater risk of developing osteoarthritic changes, which will obviously influence um, an individual's ability to perform. As Terry mentioned with the systematic review, individuals may return to sports, but the real uh, focus or the real question is whether or not they're able to return to pre-injury level and competitive sports, which they once participated prior. This study and other studies have shown that the fear of re-injury seems to be a big discriminating factor as far as some of these individuals returning back to pre-injury level, but also structure. The structures that were reconstructed or repaired in the knee can also fit, uh, play a significant role as well. A couple studies to bring in mind, one by Carey in American Journal of Sports Medicine in 06, looked at NFL running backs and wide receivers. 80% returned back to NFL play, but performance was decreased by a third. Thus, we need to look at the level of performance, not only just whether or not they're able to return. A study was performed at our institute in Birmingham with Dr. Andrews and Dr. Lima looked at NFL players who underwent an ACL patellar tendon graft. About 63% returned back to NFL play. The average length to return was around 11 months. Also, players who had more than four years of experience had a higher return rate, and players drafted in higher rounds, the first rounds of the NFL draft, also did better. As Terry pointed out in her excellent paper, about 45% of the individuals were not able to return back to their pre-injury level or sport participation, which is alarmingly high when you consider how we feel about ACL reconstructions. What were some of the reasons that they weren't able to return? As Terry mentioned, fear of re-injury was a high factor. Individuals that complained of kinesiophobia, if you will, were around 45%. In addition, Individuals that noted some episodes or isolated episode of giving way or more were up to 68%. So as was previously mentioned, fear of re-injury or structural failure also correlated with their low rate of return to sport. Another parameter that was evaluated by this particular paper was quadricep peak torque to body weight ratio. This is an important parameter to look at. We're not sure from previous studies it was conducted at our center, as well as others, that this actually causes a return to function, but when people do return back to functional activities, it appears that the quadriceps score is quite high. Other factors to look at, 
is the Tegler score, but also persistent knee effusion. These individuals were six months to a year and still 21% still had a uh, effusion in their knee. So specific questions we need to ask about this particular paper is not only the age of the patient, but what type of patients were studied? Were these young athletes, competitive athletes, recreational athletes? Were they professional? And so I think this kinesiophobia, this fear of re-injury, may be related to the level that the person is participating, but also their skill level as well. Also, who determined um, who was ready to return back to sports and how were those tests carried out? We know in professional athletes, there's numerous clinicians involved, physicians, athletic trainers, physical therapists, all evaluating these patients. A big issue in my mind is the recreational athlete, the high school female athlete or the high school male athlete who's run out of visits and is now seeing a physician at six months and asking the question, can I go back to full participation? Or the recreational skier who may not have been in therapy for the last three months and may not be compliant with their exercise program. Is it safe for them to return and are they at a higher risk of re-injury and even more osteoarthritis changes later on? So what are the parameters that I think, personally, that are necessary for a person to return back to sport? Well, I think functional stability is critical in so much that static as well as dynamic stability has been restored, that they have normal or near normal articular cartilage as well as meniscal function. Range of motion is symmetrical, particularly knee extension has been shown with numerous studies, and also knee flexion to the gluteal muscles. Neuromuscular control needs to be reestablished in their involved limb but also their uninvolved limb, as we've learned from numerous studies, that the contralateral limb is very susceptible for injury. And then lastly, this whole aspect of limb confidence. And I think what restores limb confidence is a well-structured rehabilitation program that utilizes proprioceptive training, neuromuscular training, but also perturbation training, which numerous authors, Terry Shimoleski as well as Dr. Lynn Snyder-Mackler, Jay Ergang have all illustrated are very, very important parameters. Fear of re-injury, I think, can be prevented with an excellent rehabilitation program. I want to thank uh, JOSPT as well as JBS to allow me to comment on this particular excellent research paper. And also, I want to compliment Dr. Shimolevsky and our co-investigators. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kevin. That was an outstanding review. Our next author is Dr. Freddy Fu, and he's going to present his paper now. Thank you very much for allowing me to present this very timely uh, topic of return to sport uh, after a reconstruction. Now, you see this kind of patients that demand you to allow them to go back to sports. This particular gentleman came to see me at about three and a half to four months. And you say, Dr. Fu, uh, this is what I'm doing right now, and I want to play uh, my high school football this weekend. I'm sure you see this kind of individuals from time to time. So what I did is, uh, besides examining this patient, I did an MRI, and you can see on your left side, the graph is intact uh, with a medium to high signal, which signifies it's still very immature but the patient insists that he wants to go back to play and about two, three weeks later, he did return his ACL. Now, this all started about in the 1990 when John Shelburne published a landmark paper essentially uh, taking our crutches, uh, our cats away from ACL surgery, encouraging us to uh, go faster immediate motion and go back to sport as early as four months. So it's a very good idea. The question is, does it swing the pendulum too far, too fast? Now, this is what we've been telling our patients for the last 25 years. Um, if you come to see me, I offer on you, there'll be 95% success rate, and you'll be back in six months. The question is, how true is it? And I think this is very controversial. And in my practice, I think this uh, time has become longer and longer. Now, there are many factors that uh, influence return to play. Surgery, 
Now we'll talk about anatomical reconstruction, graft type, healing, knee function, symptoms, range of motion, laxity, strength, functional testing, kind of sports, patient compliance, and fear we talk about. This paper from Melbourne, Australia, uh, looked at 7,000 patients in the systemic review, up to 40 months follow-up. And you can see only about half of this patient uh, can return to competitive sports. Many of them can go back to recreation sports. So the results are not as good as we want it to be. Another paper in HSM from the Moon Group follow uh, 100 soccer players. Initially, about 70% uh, went back to play soccer, but if you look at that in seven years, only about 36% still play. Of course, this is multifactorial, influenced by knee uh, factors, lifestyle changes, and um, fear, maybe. Uh, in Pittsburgh, we look at this, um, you know, uh, failure rate uh, on allograph, and this is a true failure rate, not just re revision rate. So we followed this patient for four years, and we found out that about 13% actually fail, followed by examination um, and KT-1000 and MRI. Uh, and half fail before nine months, especially if you go back to sports early in male uh, and teenage patients. So the kind of graph we use, especially allograph, carry a very dangerous uh, message that you cannot really allow these people to go back to early. Now, this is a classic study done by Safi Wu uh, group, um, essentially to look at the biomechanics uh, of ACL reconstruction. Essentially, if you put the ACL anatomically in the correct position, two things happen to the knee in this robotic study. The knee kinematics will return to normal, and also the ACL graph will see the normal incisal force. But if you place the graph in a non-anatomical position, the knee kinematic will be affected, and also the force in the graph will be less. So in other words, an anatomical place graph actually see more force than a one that placed anatomically. And so if the graph is not healing enough, this force may potentially rupture, you know, this early phase of healing. This study from Denmark, uh, ACL, um, you know, Resistrum, showed that at 40 year revision rate, if you do an AM drilling, which is probably more anatomical, you have a higher revision rate than true transdebial, probably non, more, more non-anatomical. And these are all hamstring graphs and are allowed to go back to six months to sports. So the question is, have they looked at healing, which they probably have not, and they probably should change uh, the therapy regimen if they're gonna you know, follow anatomical reconstruction. Now, another study in JVJS from the Moon Group uh, looked at the transdebial technique versus um, uh, medial drilling technique and found out that the non-anatomical technique has 2.5 higher odds of repeated surgery within the first six years. So in, in other words, if you put the ACL in the wrong position uh, because of abnormal kinematics or increased loading of other joint structures, there will be more metastasis and cartilage damage. So essentially, you're uh, robbing Paul to pay Peter, in a sense. Now, the next slide is a series of MRI of the same patient, a National Hockey League player. It's a quarter step tendon at time zero on the left side. The signal is uh, low and dark when the uh, quarter step was half a set and plays in. The times go on, three to six months, you can see as a medium and high signal of the graph, signal five healing, revascularization and up to one year before the graph become a low signal again, uh, signify healing. So I think if you're going to allow this patient to return to sports at about six months, uh, maybe this particular patient may carry a higher risk uh, of um, failure. So in my clinic right now, uh, if anybody want to return to sport less than six months, I would uh, order an MRI to see exactly in what phase of healing. Now the next uh, slide show um, a study done by Chris Hanna and Dr. Tashman in our lab. Uh, they put bits into a tension graph and walk this patient. Uh, essentially, uh, you can see there's motion uh, in the beats of this um, patient. And essentially, at six weeks, there's still a lot of motion in the graph. 
And the question is, is this motion healthy or not healthy to the uh, healing of the graph? And my impression, if there's too much motion, it's not, probably not a very good idea. The next MI show a professional cricket player, uh, and he returned to sport at six, four months post-op uh, with a BTB autograph. And I was able to do his MI at seven months when he returned to see me because his knee, knee is a little bit lax. And you can see at seven months, despite the fact he has no functional complaint and playing professional sports, the graph doesn't look healthy. It's uh, you know, medium to high signals, and there's a partial rupture of the graph. Next, you can see some study by Connie Chu uh, from Stanford. This uh, you know, MRI uh, using the fast sequence T2 image, and red signifies healing. So you can see at six months, uh, the graph is quite immature. At two years, uh, the, the more mature, but it's not 100% healed. Uh, this really uh, go inside with doc what Dr. Scott Dye have said for many years, that it takes up to almost 18 months to two years uh, before you can reach so-called hemostasis uh, within the knee after a serial construction. And you have to live without the envelope of function uh, during that time. So as a surgeon, uh, as a therapist, we must know graft healing and what kind of graft we use during surgery. For example, in BTB graft, uh, as you can see uh, the picture on your left side, there's very good healing, bone to bone in the tunnel. But if you use soft tissue graft or even allograft, as you can see, uh, this is a soft tissue graft over the top uh, in an open growth situation. Uh, to reach that kind of um, low signal graft, it takes uh, almost nine months to one year to see bone to bone healing in this, um, you know, uh, I'm sorry, bone to soft tissue healing in this situation. So in Pittsburgh, uh, with the system of J. Ergang, we uh, essentially have this functional milestone progression for our patient. So essentially, the patient will progress, but they cannot go to the next milestone until they satisfy uh, all the requirements. So you, you start walking fast, and then you can do some running, and then agility, jumping, cutting, and then return to sport. At the same time, we also look at the quarter-step strength uh, and neuromuscular control. And even one year, usually the quad strength is not, you know, is only about 90, 95%. It's hard to get uh, equal to the other side. So I think that we do functional testing uh, in the later stage, when patients have uh, no pain, swelling, or stability, they have good neuromuscular control, good quarter of strength. Uh, we use the HOPE test and other functional testing, such, such as uh, BioDex also. So in summary, I think that we like to use criteria-based return to sports, individualized multifactorial approach, patient procedure, graft type healing, progression in rehab, and now we tend to have a slower return to sports schedule. Future prospective studies to identify pr predictors of safe early or long-term return to play um, is needed. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Freddie. Uh, that was you know, a fantastic overview of the literature, uh, both clinical and basic science, and, and also your experience. I like the examples. Uh, let's hear what Kurt Spindler has to add. Kurt? Well, it's a truly a pleasure and an honor to be able to participate in this webinar. Um, Dr. Fu has aptly pointed out the paucity of studies on a return to play, particularly to a specific sport, like football or soccer or basketball, the most common, at least in the United States. And we have been provided with studies that show clearly a less than ideal return to sport initially without even dealing with longevity or performance. And we've also been presented with some hypothesized factors, some proven, but we really want to know what predicts or what risk factors are there to return to a sport. So we must evaluate the, the multitude of risk factors within a large enough cohort. We must really determine what the actual return to rate for a specific sport is, as outlined, and we must understand our athletic populations. And so if you want to find out the highest evidence return to sport, we really need large prospective cohorts that really don't exist. They have to be of sufficient size to look at some comprehensive multivariate modeling. That means you have to look at 
the most po uh, potent or potential hypothesized risk factors in the same statistical model. We then have to define what the sport is and what the return to that specific sport means. The only thing that we have that is a close and it's an alternative, but not to a specific sport, is a study published within the Moon cohort on 1,512 patients with multivariate modeling looking at Mark's activity level. And if we look at this data that was published by Cox and AJSM in 2014, we had 1,512 ACL reconstructions at a minimum of six-year follow-up with 85% follow-up of these patients. The Mark's activity scale is a range from zero to 16, and at time zero, at the time of surgery, their average activity was 12. At two years, it had dropped to nine, and at seven years, it dropped to seven. And when you look at the modeling that was done, the proven predictors of athletic activity, the ones that returned to sport better were uh, younger age, were, were male, had lower BMIs, were not smokers, had a higher educational status, the, did not have a revision surgery, so revision surgery uh, was definitely a risk factor for not returning to that activity level. And also the longer time from surgery, as just shown by the average, the less likely they're participating in sports. And what is really noticeable here is that there's really lack of knee-specific findings, sort of like grade one MCL, meniscal pathology, or really articular cartilage here. So most of these factors are not related to the knee except for revision. If you want to avoid failure, um, and failure is a problem at two years, in a recent uh, presentation in the Moon Group, Chris Kading presented in 2014 the, a 93% follow-up at two years for 2,488 primary ACL reconstructions only. And we'll show you the graph in the next slide. So if you really want to avoid failure, uh, which will not get someone back to sport, really avoid allographs in the high school and college population. And the results really showed that younger age and higher activity are really increased predictors of both the ipsilateral, the ACL reconstruction, but they're also predictors of the contralateral, normal ACL. And so by looking at this graph, and this graph uh, is a summation of it, the red line is the allograph failure line, the green line is the hamstring autograph failure line, and the black line is the BTB autograph. And what you should know in the multivariate modeling is that the lines between the autographs, the BTB and the hamstrings, are not significantly different. Though there are different, those numbers are within the margin of error for each one of those. But if you want to interpret the graph, it's really quite simple. If you look at someone who's 40 years old, all those lines converge. The failure rates are almost the same. The absolute differences are very small, less than 1 or 2%. However, if you go to the 14-year-old or the 20-year-old, if you take that age and follow a line straight up, you can read the failure rate for the autographs, you can read the failure rate for the allographs. And there's somewhere a 14 or 15 percent difference in that 18-year-old between the chance of failure with an allograft or versus an autograph. So the, the, clearly in the ipsilateral side, allograft does matter, and it matters particularly in the younger population but not in the older population. So return to sport is really not a simple matter at all. How do you deal with multi-sport athletes, athletes that play more than one, and which sport do they want to return to? And finally, return to sport initially is one performance measure, but what about maintaining that sport in the long term? How many years can they play? And finally, even if you return to sport and you're able to play, what about your actual performance for a competitive athlete? Are they able to return to sport in high school and then advance to college, or return to sport in college and advance to professional levels? And I think in the future we need to be we clearly define what sport we are talking about, what performance and longevity, and define those, those variables or outcomes. And I think we need to include the majority of relevant hypothesized risk factors in a similar statistical model so we can set up a hierarchy of what are the most important findings. I think what we can learn from now is that there is a proven activity analysis, and we can also say that allographs in high school and college and competitive athletes lead to higher failure and clearly those people are not going to return to sports. So thank you for the opportunity. It is my pleasure to be able to present tonight. Uh, Kurt, that was uh, outstanding. Uh, uh, as usual, very succinct, evidence-based presentation, very informative. Uh, we're going to go to the audience questions in just a couple of minutes. Um, I just had a question of my own for, uh, for Kevin Wilk. Um, if I was a physical therapist, Kevin, and uh, I had a patient 
after surgery who wanted to go back to sports too soon, let's say six months or even earlier than that, and they were really on me about getting back. Uh, how would I handle that with the patient surgeon and the patient? What do you do in that situation which does arise? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question, Dr. Marks, and it happens all the time. Um, I think the first thing that I personally do in the clinic is I obviously talk with the patient uh, and also the patient's family. So we're talking about individuals in high school or maybe even a little bit younger. Obviously, the patient's parents need to come into the equation as well. But when we deal with professional athletes, it's a lot different. The first thing we look at is range of motion symmetry. Second, we look at circumference measurements. We try to point out objectively if there's a difference between one leg versus the other. We follow that up with a KT as uh, Terry illustrated in her paper. So we'll do a knee arthrometer test, objectively measuring what the laxity is of their knee. And we follow that up with a biodex test, an isokinetic test, then a functional test, as Dr. Fu mentioned. And often we'll do a hop test, bring in all the objective data, convey that to the patient very succinctly and in a, in a manner that they can understand. And then, and only then, if they still have desires to return and, and are very, um, very uh, dogmatic about it or persistent, then I'll bring the physician into the equation. But many times these patients actually think they're ready to go back. And when you test them and you show them that they're way off, they really back down. And they, sometimes that test is very important for them to realize where they're at. Very helpful information, uh, Kevin. Appreciate that. Uh, we're going to move to the audience questions now. There are a ton of great questions, uh, so thank you to the audience, a tremendous audience, great response. And I'd like to thank Mark Swankowski for organizing the questions uh, because I'm sure that was a lot of work as I see them pouring in. Uh, let's start with, uh, I think this is a very interesting question. Uh, we'll, I'll ask Freddie first, and then I'll ask Kurt to comment. Uh, is there a difference for return to sport after allograft versus autograft ACL reconstruction? And also, if there's collateral ligament reconstruction or repair MCL posterolateral corner, does that affect return to play? So, Freddie, auto versus allo and collateral, and then we'll go to Kurt after. Yeah, allograft, we hardly use it young people anymore in Pittsburgh. So I think for the... Older folks, I think they usually are not in such a hurry. But if a young person wants to allograph and want to return to sports, I would tell them before the operation it will take up to one year or longer to return, and they may not you know, choose that particular graph. But I think in our experience in Pittsburgh, uh, we really have a very, uh, you know, not a very good result. Uh, we, we, we follow the patient prospectively. Uh, not the revision rate, but the failure rate is, is very high, like, uh, you know, 15%. Uh, and many of them torn within the first nine months. So I would definitely avoid allograft uh, in young, uh, active people. In older folks, 40 years plus, uh, they're more sensible, maybe. And I think you can, uh, um, you know, uh, feel safe to use it. Now, in terms of uh, the collateral, um, um, you know, ligament surgery, I think that um, depends on, on when you're going to get it. If you can re re repair that uh, anatomically early, and uh, if you can uh, get the motion going early, uh, you know, I, I think that you can assess the healing. Uh, uh, the collateral healing can actually heal faster than the ACL uh, in, in, in a way. So I think that if the progress as well, uh, it may not hamper. Now, the only thing is if you do collateral ligament surgery, uh, you may sometime uh, have motion problem. And in those cases, um, you may slow the patient progress. If the patient cannot extend completely, uh, the core strength may be weak, uh, they may be swallowing and walking, so those are the factors, actually, that will affect uh, people with uh, multi-ligament uh, surgery. So I think uh, the doctor and the therapist and trainer should work together very closely in this kind of cases to emphasize uh, early motion, get back to motion good, and, uh, and then follow by the strength. And of course, examine the patient very carefully. Thank you. Uh, Kurt, anything to add? Well, I think that we, we have never looked at uh, MCL injuries as it relates to a specific return to a, a, a sport, whether that's football or soccer, that we've reported on. When we looked at grade one or grade two MCLs that didn't require surgery, and we asked the question about the COOS or the IKDC or the MARCs, it didn't make any difference. Now, we purposely excluded 
the grade three MCLs, which a lot of times those are operated on, so we don't have any information in that. My own opinion is that if you have a grade three MCL repaired, I agree with what Freddie said, that it's, they can be more difficult and one has to be careful. Uh, they may not go back to sports. And again, I think they, I agree with what um, Dr. Fu said, again, that the use, of, it's, the use of allografts in young people is problematic, and clearly if you rupture your graft, that's not something you're going to return to sport. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, next question from the audience. Um, how to get athletes to overcome fear of re-injury during rehabilitation? Um, let's start with uh, Kevin on this one. Kevin Wilk. Yeah, Dr. Marks, I think there's a really important uh, point to bring out. And I, again, I want to compliment Terry for bringing this to our attention. I really believe that uh, as Dr. Fu mentioned, this accelerated rehab that was conveyed by Dr. Shelbourne in 1990 can help us somewhat as far as eliminating this fear of re-injury. Not so much as an early return to running and sports, but a more expedient rehab early on. And, and let me just expand on that for a minute. What I mean by a, a an ex, more expedient rehab is not so much baby the limb in the first week or two, Maybe the first week, calm the knee down after an ACL, but in that second week, allow them to begin some little balance activities, some mini squats, maybe being on some foam or some unstable surfaces, such as a rocker board. And that way, the person starts building confidence back into the limb. And I think it's a gradual process as they gain neuromuscular control. Many times what we see in higher-level athletes is that they actually feel better about their reconstructed limb at eight weeks, nine weeks, than they do on their uninjured limb. When they do a high-level unilateral task, they often say, my ACL side feels better to me than my uninjured side. And I think if you start a program with early neuromuscular training, perturbation training, early and safely, I think you can build that confidence pretty early in a person's rehab process. This Thank you very much. Uh, Terry, would you like to add anything to uh, what uh, Kevin said? Yes, I would. I would like to add um, that from the research that we've done, what we've seen is that patients uh, in the first four, four weeks or month after surgery tend to decline with their fear of re-injury. And then some people right around the 12 weeks when they start doing activities that are going to you know, stress the knee a little bit in the advanced phase of rehab, actually start increasing in their fear of re-injury. So from my perspective, I think that the advanced phase of rehab is a really important time frame to focus on. The other thing is as far as interventions, um, I think we expect that when we do jumping and agility and those types of activities, that that will help. It's, it's like the bridge until they go back to sport and that should decrease fear of re-injury. But we did a randomized controlled trial where we, we actually monitored their plyometric activity, including agility and jumping. And if you look from the start to the end of that program, over eight weeks, there was no change in fear. The mean fear score did not change, but confidence went up. So one of the things that we've been talking about here at UF is that maybe we need to look at how we're, how we're addressing fear and ask the patient what they're fearful of. Because if you think about the exposure paradigms used in psychology, you have to expose people to the things that they're fear of, fearful of. And we have done some pilot testing on that. Both Trevor Lentz and Kevin Maloney have done that. And what people answer they're fearful of isn't always jumping. It could be, I'm afraid of being hit in, in the knee. I'm afraid of doing this type of activity. And so it may be that rehabilitation needs to be a little bit more directed on those activities. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, another uh, good question here, we'll stick with Terry. Uh, what strength testing do you do prior to return to sports and any proprioceptive testing, Terry? So right now we don't have any standardized proprioceptive testing that we do. Um, so I, I, I can't give the audience something that I would say this is the best test, but certainly proprioceptive is tested indirectly through some functional testing over at the U.S. Health Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Institute, they will do the STAR balance. And then as part of the things that we've learned from working with the U.F. athletes is, is doing tests like, um, you know, more the functional type tests, uh, single leg hop or 
double leg hops and you look at how they perform that. And if you see that movement is visibly altered, then I would consider going through your screen of what impairments are there and potentially um, proprioception is one of them. The other question, can you repeat the first part of the question because I forgot before proprioception. Uh, what strength testing do you do prior to return to sport and proprioceptive testing? Yeah, so strength testing is what I reported in the paper and it's um, doing isokinetic testing at 60 degrees per second. And I saw one of the questions was what about doing, you know, the isokinetic velocity spectrum? So maybe doing 180 degrees per second, 300 degrees per second or something like that. And what I will say is if you want to look at the force, the best is to do lower speeds, but potentially, and this is where our, our research is going a little bit, is looking at, at measures like return uh, rate of torque development or power. And for that, you would need to do uh, faster testing, but I can't comment specifically on what's going to be the best measure at this time. Thank you very much. Um, is there any data, another question from the audience here, any data on the effect of hamstring strength on return to sport? Uh, maybe we'll start with Kurt and then Freddie. Do you care about hamstring strength for return to sport? Well, all of, that sport, all of that's part of the whole functional recovery of the leg. And I think you have to really look at their, their hip strength uh, being just as important as well as their, their, their um, gastroc or their calf strength. So I think you have to look at the entire leg, and the hamstring is important as part of that. How you assess that uh, and how you predict whether someone can go back and how they can perform, I don't think that's known. But you have to really look at the whole leg from the hip all the way down to your gastroc and also including your hamstring and quad. Freddie, any comment on hamstring strength relating to return to return? Yeah, I think maybe the question points to the fact that some people uh, argue that we should not use hamstring graft because taking the hamstring away uh, may, may not protect, you know, the ACL in some way because hamstring is supposed to be the protector. <laughs> of this ACL, so I think, but I, I think uh, what happened is there's some regrowth, uh, maybe the, the hamstring will, will never come back 100%, but there seems to be some scar tissue to reattach uh, part of the hamstring so the muscle still will function in some way. Uh, so I think, again, like Kurt said, we you need to look into that, but anytime you take away uh, your own graft, uh, your patella tendon, quadriceps tendon, or hamstring, you, you're going to take a little bit of things away, and you're going to lose something away, and I think this is a give and take. So, uh, but on the other hand, I think if you see, see people with hamstring, uh, you know, surgery, they can return to a high level too. But of course, you should definitely uh, assess the strength, uh, just like um, you know, Kurt have said. Excellent, hey, Dr. Martin, This is Excellent. Kevin. Can I jump in for a second? Yes, please. We wrote a paper in '94 in JOSPT where we looked at correlation between lower extremity strength on isokinetics as well as hop tests subjective knee scores using the noise subjective knee score as well as agility tests. And unfortunately, hamstrings did not correlate, even though I think it is important, as Dr. Spindler mentioned. We did not look at hip, which we plan on doing in the future in a particular study as well. But what was interesting was quadricep peak torque to body weight at 180 degrees per second, as well as acceleration rate at a very high correlation in so much as when you're sitting there on an isopanic device, if you accelerated very quickly and meet your peak torque quickly, you scored your knee very high, but also your agility scores are very high, as well as your hop test. Interesting. Um, Kevin, while, we're, uh, while you're uh, going there, let's uh, ask you a question from the audience here. Uh, at three months post-op, what do you tell patients about progression? I think this is an interesting question because at three months people start to feel you know, pretty normal. And how do you supervise their progression is the question at three months post-op. Yeah, three months is always a difficult time because at three months, 12 weeks, they're feeling great, as you mentioned, Dr. Marks. And so they want to do more. And you almost have to throw them some some um, activities that challenge them because otherwise they're going to go out and shoot baskets and things that you don't want them to do. For us, we're fortunate we have a treadmill like the Ultra G that we can use a percent body weight where you're right at a lower percentage. So we give them that cardiovascular fix with running. We can put them in a pool and do some agility training. So I think in athletes that are very highly motivated, I think you have to do something with them at 12 weeks. Otherwise, they're going to do something on their own that may not be 
what you desire them to do, especially a, a young basketball player. So no cutting, no deceleration, no jumping uh, in an uncontrolled manner. But at 12 weeks for me, I think they can run in a gravity-eliminated treadmill in a pool and do the neuromuscular training that we talked about. Great advice, great advice. Terry, anything to add to uh, uh, Kevin Wilk's comments? No, um, the only thing that I would say is that definitely um, at three months, starting with the running program is good, and then from there, the thing that I would think the most about is what, how are the forces on the knee and uh, with different activities and, and be very graded in how you progress that. So doing exercises like jumping on the, the, the leg press before you do two-legged jumps standing and then from two-legged jump standing, then you work your way to one leg, uh, single leg jumps. So that, as far as the progression, I would really monitor the vertical ground reaction forces. Um, Great advice. Can, can I add a few words? Yes, of course. Yeah, and three months to me is a very dangerous time. Uh, but this is a time actually, I spend more time with the patient in the clinic and explain to them, you feel so good, you might, may like to do many things. And I would give them example that how people get re-injured, uh, you know, in many, many uh, ways that they, do, they don't pay attention to, like uh, throwing a frisbee. I have people even doing skydiving because it's not a cutting exercise, you know. Uh, and I mean, do all kinds of things, you know. So really, I spend a little more time with a patient at the time, basically, to emphasize that they should not, you know, go too wild uh, with activities. Thank you. Um, now, another question from the audience is uh, the value of functional bracing on return to sport. Freddie, can you please carry on and give me your thoughts on functional bracing for return to sport after ACL reconstruction? Uh, I discussed with a patient. It's not quite very scientific, but some people like it, and I give them the, the choice whether they want uh, this bracing, and then up about 50% of the patient uh, will uh, like to use the brace, and some of them would not like to have a brace. So uh, it's not like a yes or no for me. It's just like a discussion, um, you know, with them. And uh, like I say, we still need some more scientific study uh, to, to show that, you know, the effectiveness uh, of this space is, is, is really effective or it's just more a proprioception or psychological, you know, uh, you know, you know, um, you know, prophylactic things that uh, people feel like they must have, for example. So. Thank you. Kurt, your thoughts on functional bracing after ACL reconstruction? Bob, uh, Bob hear me? Yeah, Kurt? Yes. Uh, basically, the, um, it depends what you want to use it for. If you're looking for re-injury, then clearly the, um, any meta-analysis or even our large data says your opposite knee has exactly the same uh, risk of re-injury or more. And so which knee do you want me to put it on? Uh, so I don't routinely do that. But I also agree with what Dr. Fu said. Some people want it, and it's comfort for them when they start out. So if they really request it and want it, and that's a transition period for them to get back to sport, I'll give it to them. But I won't use it in a routine on a primary ACL without any collateral ligament injury. Thanks. So I think to summarize that, there's not good evidence to support the use of bracing, which is why there's not a lot of enthusiasm. The studies have not shown value. Some patients like it. The studies, by the way, are quite small, and since re-injury is rare, they're generally underpowered. And with that, we're out of racetrack tonight. It's been uh, fascinating uh, for me. And before we close tonight with Dr. Swiankowski, I want to thank our speakers for their presentations, which I enjoyed a lot. And I would like to thank you all for joining us. As you exit this webinar, please take a moment to fill out the short survey, which will help us evaluate this presentation as well as plan for future webinars. I hope you found the session valuable. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Marks and all the speakers for putting together today's webinar. We truly hope that you enjoyed this presentation. This webinar will be archived for six months in the event you or your colleagues would like to listen again. And as we mentioned earlier, the slides will be emailed to you at noon tomorrow. We look forward to hearing your feedback on tonight's webinar. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and we hope to continue to bring you information in formats that are convenient for you. Thank you, and good night.